والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم ذل الذين ينفقون اموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبه انبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويخلق ما لا تعلمون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Peace and Allah's mercy be upon you Welcome to Universal Quran This is where we study the Quran Allah's scripture to humanity and its explanation, its interpretation in the science of tafsir. We're studying from the 30th section or juz of the Holy Quran. Today we're on chapter 96, Al-Alaq. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Fayruz. Uh, Fayruz is our Quran reciter from Singapore. And Bilal, he is the interpreter in the English language from our, uh, our good friend Canada. Um, this is a very important episode. Uh, Surah Al-Alaq is the first chapter of the Holy Quran revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was 40 years of age, approximately the year 610 from the current calendar. The Prophet, uh, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, was retiring to a cave in a mountain outside of the town of Mecca uh, when the angel Gabriel appeared to him and brought him the first five verses of this important surah, which in, contains uh, great aspects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, wisdom and benefit for mankind. This is a universal scripture. It's meant for all times and all places. But it was revealed specifically at specific times and places. And there is a great amount of wisdom for us knowing exactly the context in which these things happened so that we can understand the full story behind these chapters of the Holy Quran. That way we can develop our lives in along the intended meaning of these chapters rather than reading into it something from our own imaginations which every religion, every group at one time or another uh, reads into books into scriptures what they wanted rather than what the, uh, the uh, Lord who revealed these scriptures intends by their meaning. We're going to start out today reading the first five verses of this chapter. I'm going to ask Fayruz to go ahead and read it in Arabic for us. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم Thank you. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan the outcast. In the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful. Read, in the name of your Lord, who has created all that exists. Has created man from a clot. Read, and your Lord is the Most Generous. Who has taught by the pen. He has taught man that which he knew not. So the first revelation of the Holy Quran. The angel Gabriel appeared to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, And read and recited to him, uh, this commandment. And of course the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was awestruck as anybody would be as a human being who was not prepared for uh, seeing the angels, for seeing uh, a moment like this. As Allah said in the Holy Quran that he did not even, was not even aware what uh, scripture was, what faith was. The Prophet Sallallahu had never had it intended in his mind that he was going to be a prophet and that he was going to bring a message to humanity. He was a businessman, an honest, upright person in his community. He was a father, uh, a husband, 
uh, who had children. And this came as a shock and a surprise. And so he uh, states, uh, when he describes this moment, how uh, the angel Gabriel squeezed him, how it put this pressure on him, commanding him to read. And he would say, I'm not able to read. The Prophet ﷺ was not an educated person. He never had time, being an orphan who was working from a very young age, supporting himself and caring for himself. He never had time to study, to learn to read. He was an unlettered person. And in fact, uh, Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, uh, considered that uh, they were the upper class people of the society. They were the descendants of Abraham through Ismail. They were the most respected people in Arabia. And they didn't need to read or do math. They hired secretaries and uh, accountants to do that stuff for them. They didn't need to actually learn those things for themselves. But that was for other people to do. And so he never had a chance to read. And now he's being commanded, read. This should tell us the importance in Islam of education, of study, of reading the Holy Quran. Because of course, what is he supposed to be reading? He's supposed to be reading aloud the verses of the Holy Quran. Because Iqra means read silently, or especially read out loud. And the Qur'an is usually recited out loud uh, in the Arabic language. Uh, you will see in some translations of the Holy Qur'an in English, uh, under the influence of the Orientalists, people, non-Muslim people of the West who have studied Islam, Islam as a culture and a history, more than as uh, a true faith from, that was revealed by God, uh, they would translate Iqra as recite, and that is because it is close to the Syriac and Aramaic word, which means uh, to proclaim. And so they'll say, not pr recite out loud, but to proclaim, as in proclaiming a message. But when we look at these verses, uh, Iqra definitely means read, because then when we look, it's repeated twice, and then Allah says, He taught by the pen. So this Quran was meant to be recited aloud by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and from the very first day, the Prophet ﷺ had it written down by his scribes, by, by uh, people who knew how to write, and it was collected in a book. And this verse is telling us of the importance of the knowledge of the book, the knowledge of the pen, which became, of course, the whole foundation of Islamic civilization and still remains. The key to success in any group of people is the level of their education and knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, read in the name of your Lord who created. That your Lord is, is the creator. What are you supposed to read? The Quran which He is revealing. All of these are aspects of Allah's Lordship. That He created the human being and guides the human being and teaches the human being. Uh, because of Allah's Lordship, because his attributes are perfect and superior, then he deserves also not only that we recognize that God exists, that he made us, that he cares for us and gave us this world, but also that he deserves exclusively our devotion in worship, our ibadah, and that we should be his servants. And then our tawheed, or our recognition of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is then complete, not before. Um, we should mention that when Allah said, read in the name of your Lord, that when we recite the Qur'an, we recite the Basmala in the name of Allah, uh, the merciful, the compassionate, before reading the Qur'an. And that is, of course, uh, what every single Muslim man and woman and child knows, to read in the name of their Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the second verse, that Allah created the human being, mankind, from alaq, from a clot. This is very important because this is the first time that uh, humanity understood the development in the f of the fetus, of the child in the womb of its mother in various stages. And so Allah is telling us the first different stages of, of this. In fact, if you will look at chapter 22, Al-Hajj, this is right there, you see the actual stage of the alaq, when, when uh, a clinging, uh, the clinging substance clings to the inner wall of the uterus or the womb of the mother and it develops gradually until it reaches the next stage. This is described in many different verses of Quran. Specifically, I would let you look at verse uh, 5 of Al-Hajj 22, chapter 22. If you are in doubt about the resurrection, then Allah mentions He created human being from the dust, that is, Adam, then from the alaqa, which looks 
it develops, looks like a leech, specifically. Araka means a leech that clings onto something. And then it develops from that, yes? <clears throat> no, no, no. Oh, it develops into uh, uh, a lump of flesh. It looks like it's been chewed, a chewed lump of flesh where the vertebrae, the skeletal system is forming. Up until the 19th century, human beings didn't know about this development. It wasn't part of our science. Western science believed up until a uh, little over 100 years ago that in the fetus, in the womb of its mother, was a fully developed human being, just tiny, microscopic, mm -hmm. and it just gradually grew. They didn't realize that the child developed in the womb in stages until, it, uh, there you see the, 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 the uh, the third stage where it's the, the lump of flesh and then it develops all the different parts. The eyes are developed from, from the uh, early stage to the last stage. All that develops from the cells, from the sperm and uh, fertilizing the egg, developing into, into this you know, uh, beautiful child within the womb of the mother. The Prophet ﷺ explained to us that there are 40-day stages and upon the last stage, that's when the angel comes into the womb and decrees the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree for that child, how long it's going to live, whether it's going to be a Muslim or non-Muslim, die in Islam or die outside of Islam, whether it's going to be, it's, you know, what its deeds are going to be, um, what its livelihood is going to be. And so things are decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a certain stage in the womb. Uh, but this is from every single stage. It's a reflection of Allah's uh, greatness, Allah's care and perfection. So even though the fetus hasn't reached the full development, it's still the embryonic human being that should be cared for. It should not be killed. It should not be uh, uh, aborted for no reason unless there's a, a scientific medical reason that it should, you know, it's not going to be viable or it's going to cause harm to the mother. It deserves our respect and care. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the care to put it in a safe, protective place within the body of its mother so that it can develop safely into the uh, you know, advanced human being. There's a tie-in between this and the next verse. Read, for your Lord is most generous, al-akram, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to do something which He has developed from the time we're in the womb as our brain starts developing. At this stage, it starts developing into what is designed to, for human language. The brain is designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for advanced language. It's not that the human being suddenly just decided to start talking, but the brain of the human being before its birth is already designed to listen, hear, speak, and of course eventually to learn to read and write. It's part of the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for the human being. So it's part of Allah's uh, mercy and generosity to mankind that we can spread knowledge through reading. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught by the pen. He taught writing to produce laws, to spread the teachings that every society, Muslim or non-Muslim, has used writing to spread in order to have an advanced civilization so that knowledge doesn't just die with the person who has it, but it can be taught and it can be recorded and saved and preserved. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the Qur'an in written form as well as within the breasts of those people who have learned the Qur'an by heart. And so he taught man that which he had not known. This is important to realize that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, from the first revelation, it's made clear to him that this is going to be knowledge revealed to you by Allah that you did not previously know. It wasn't the Prophet ﷺ, uh, thought deeply about certain things and wrote them down in a book and he said this book is from Allah SWT, as people believe. But actually, the Qur'an is Allah's knowledge, which the Prophet ﷺ and other human beings were not aware of before Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ was taught what he did not know. That's all we have time for before the break. We'll come back and finish this uh, chapter. <laughs> Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Most High spoke the Quran. It's the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we given the rights of the Quran? Are you ready to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment for the Quran to take us from our hands to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we go through every verse in the Quran to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? Watch Huda TV. 
القرآن إن دبث يهدي به الله من اتبع Welcome back to Universal Quran. We're reading from chapter 96, Al-Alaq. Before the break, we were discussing the first five verses, which were revealed, the first part of the Quran that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, the entire Quran at that time was sent down from Allah al-Mahfud, which is the preserved tablet uh, created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which contains Allah's, uh, the Quran, and was brought down to the lowest heaven, to what is called Bayt al izza in the, the lowest uh, heaven, to be gradually revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in stages, over time, over the next 23 years. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Since this was the first five verses, and uh -huh. why is it being placed in the last, I mean, last section of the Qur'an? Yes. Each part of the Qur'an. The Qur'an as it is now was preserved in the Loh al-Mahfud the preserved tablet, exactly in the order in which it is now. But different parts were revealed at different times according to circumstances. And then the angel Gabriel would instruct the Prophet وسلم, where to place that in order. So the order in which the Qur'an is, is the order in which it was recited by the Prophet وسلم, in his Salat, especially in Ramadan. Every, time, in every year in Ramadan, the Prophet وسلم, would recite the whole Qur'an from beginning to end with uh, Jibril with Gabriel and the final year of his life he recited it two times in the month of Ramadan and so Allah knows the wisdom and we can examine and we can very much see that the, the surah is a unity but it was actually revealed at different times and the different parts were put there by the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so we can see for example how it ties into the next verses which were revealed later on that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, created us from these stages. Every single stage, we were helpless, but we were given everything we need. We were given great, uh, great uh, um, uh, uh, perfection uh, of the human being by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the highest level that the human being can be so that the human being can do what no other creature on this earth does, no other physical creature that we can see, which is uh, choose Islam and to submit uh, willingly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, or unwillingly on the Day of Judgment if we refuse. Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about His care and compassion for the human being, and then says, and we'll read the next two, the next three verses, six through eight. كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَرْوَآهُ اسْتَغْنَى إِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الرُّجْعَى Nay, verily, man does transgress all bounds, because he considers himself self-sufficient. Surely unto your Lord is the return. So yes, even though these verses were revealed later, they're definitely, uh, uh, it's all one surah, it's all one flow, one chapter. Allah is telling us of His blessings, and then says, yet the human being uh, transgresses beyond all bounds. He considers that he is self-sufficient, even though he was created from uh, a s tiny substance, a microscopic substance within the womb of his mother and developed without any of our power. We didn't develop ourselves, nor did our parents develop us by their own will, but by the will of Allah. Yet we consider that we are self-sufficient. Uh, but we're all going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, specifically, we consider ourselves self-sufficient when we're successful financially. And so Allah is talking specifically to people in Mecca at that time, but it applies to everybody in all times who achieve success in this world, achieve money and wealth and power, and consider they don't need anybody and they don't need God and they don't need to obey the message of the prophets, uh, Allah's peace be upon them. And they're going to have to go back to Allah SWT and give an account. Where did you get your wealth? Where did you get your power? Did you get it honestly? Did you get it through uh, dishonest practices, through lying, cheating, stealing, uh, murder, all the ways that people get what they want in this world? And then, after you got it, how did you spend it? Did you spend it uh, on what is permitted and halal, what is healthy and good for your family, your neighbors, to improve your community uh, through helping the unfortunate? Or did you waste it in, on extravagant living, spending it on haram, spending it on wine, 
drugs, women, all kinds of things which are forbidden, which are harmful for you, you as an individual and for your family, the family structure and for the society as a whole. We have to uh, keep going here to the next verses 9 through 14, please. أرأيت الذي ينهى عبدا إذا صلى أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى أرأيت إن كذب وتولى ألم يعلم بأن الله يرى Have you seen him who prevents? A slave when he prays? Tell me if he is on the guidance of Allah or enjoins piety. Tell me if he denies the truth and turns away. Knows he not that Allah sees? These verses are specifically talking about the persecution of the Prophet ﷺ after he conveyed this message of these first verses that were revealed to him and conveyed it to his people. His people, his uncles, his relatives were powerful members of the society of Mecca. And his, his clan, his group, the Quraysh, were influential and respected, the most noble and most respected people in society. But they did not welcome his message, but ridiculed and rejected and persecuted him and those Muslims who did follow the message of the Prophet ﷺ. These verses are specifically talking about Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl was one of the, the great enemies of the Prophet. Uh, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. The Prophet would go to the Kaaba to pray, to Allah's house that was originally built by Abraham within the holy mosque of Mecca. And he would go there to pray despite the fact that they had erected statues, idols around it. He would go up to what is the maqam, which is close to the door of the Kaaba and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And they would go there and ridicule him and people would throw refuse on him as he was bowing his head onto the ground before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abu Jahl threatened to come and stomp on his neck while he was in the prayer and wanted to uh, harm the Prophet sallallahu physically and prevent him from praying. And he vowed that he was going to stomp on his neck and push his face into the earth while he was praying. And the Prophet sallallahu was doing what by praying? Going to his Lord, drawing near to to his Lord in prayer, and being an example of piety and belief for people. And yet, he was doing this evil thing. And so, the Prophet ﷺ said, if he does so, the angels will seize him. And as it's related in, in, in some narrations, that he saw the frightening aspect, the glow or the fire or, or light coming from the angels who were guarding the Prophet ﷺ. And so, so he was frightened. He did, not do, he did not carry out this action. But uh, th- these verses say, what if Abu Jahl, what if he denies and turns away? Does he not know that Allah is watching? Does he not know that the one who is sending this message, he knows that the Prophet ﷺ was an unlettered person, an uneducated person. He knew that the Prophet ﷺ had no source of the knowledge found in this book. He knew nothing about the development of the child in the womb of the mother. He knew nothing about the, 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 the stories of the previous people, the previous prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had never previously speculated about religion and the correct religion. He wasn't known as a person who preached in the past, but now he brought this message. Suddenly, it didn't come from himself. It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We would know any of us. Uh, if you were to found your own philosophy, for example, or your own uh, religion, as people found, found, find, found their own false religions, you wouldn't suddenly get it. You would gradually develop it. And you would talk to people. And people would watch your ideas evolving in front of them as you develop your ideas into a unique, specific uh, school or, or sect. And yet the Prophet didn't do that. This all came overnight. A sudden transformation of his entire personality where he started to speak the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's continue with this in the last verses 15 through 19, please. كلا لئن لم ينتهي لنسفعا بالناصية ناصية كاذبة خاطئة فليدع نادية سندع الزبانية كلا لا تطعه واسجد واقترب Thank you. Nay, if he ceases not, we will catch him by the forelock. A lying, sinful forelock. Then let him call upon his counsel. We will call upon the, 
we will call the guards of hell to deal with him. Nay, do not obey him, fall prostrate, and draw near to Allah. So Allah said once again, Nay, Allah is rejecting absolutely the idea that somebody could get away with persecuting the Prophet Wasallam, and that they would be able to do that with impunity without being watched and observed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, if the Prophet Wasallam is rightly guided and enjoying piety, people should welcome that. Any society would welcome somebody who came in and tried to revive the lost values that makes make any civilization great and good, to tell people to do good and not to do evil. Any society would, would like the idea that there's a person who is telling people to cease evil, destructive behavior and enjoins good and decent behavior. But they rejected that as a threat to their source of power in this civilization because they controlled the pilgrimage to the holy place of Arabia where people came from thousand miles around to visit the uh, holy uh, masjid uh, founded by Abraham. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said absolutely in rejecting this, if he does not cease, we will seize him by the forelock, by the head of his, on his forehead, by the hair, by the hair that is growing on his forehead. Uh, he has no knowledge. This human being is a foolish person who has no knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and does not control his behavior, does not, uh, 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 you know, his behavior lowers him lower than the beasts, as we read in a previous surah of the Qur'an. He has lowered himself to assaulting an innocent person who is simply praying at the place which is supposed to be open to prayer for all of the people uh, to come and worship their God. And so the Prophet ﷺ never claimed to be doing anything other than worshipping the Lord who established this holy place of Mecca. The, the Lord who established the city of Mecca, who brought Hagar and Ismail and who brought Abraham to build this building. That's all he claimed to be doing. And so they should have welcomed the person who was bringing back the knowledge and religion of their forefather. But instead they rejected him. And so they wanted to humiliate him. But Allah says that he's going to be humiliated even greater. He's going to be seized by the angels and brought to hellfire, seized by his lying, sinful forelock. And so even the, the head of this man, even his, his forelock, all of his whole body is permeated with evil and wickedness. And it's even said that the frontal lobe of the brain is where it, it, the people who have had, for example, advanced brain damage to this part of their head lose their uh, uh, control over their moral behavior. And so this is uh, perhaps implying uh, knowledge of the brain that was unknown to people until the 20th century, or at least until the, the latter part of the 19th century. And so he said, I have the biggest group of counselors. I have the biggest supporters. I have the most supporters of anybody in this valley, meaning the Valley of Mecca. He, his nadi, his people who were around him and supported him, who were his supporters and trustworthy counselors. And so he said, nobody can harm me. Nobody can threaten me. But Allah saying, nay, I will call upon the guardians of hellfire and drag Abu Jahl back you, O Prophet, do not obey him, but draw near to me and pray in sajda, bowing your head to the ground before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as close as we can be to our Creator and Sustainer. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for joining us with Universal Quran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وَتَرَى الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدَةً وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ صُنْعَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ إِنَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَفْعَلُونَ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون